It is good to see you tonight and to be with you. I hope you're doing well. It is February already, which is absolutely amazing to me. Time is flying by this year, but I hope to see you at worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11. If you can sign up right now, that would be great. We would really appreciate that at uh, either of those two services. And then I also hope to see you for class this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. So 9 o'clock worship, 10 o'clock class, 11 o'clock worship. So either 9 or 11 and then also 10 o'clock in between. And I am looking forward to being with you this coming Sunday. I am hoping to head out of town this coming Sunday after worship to head down to Tennessee for the Fried Hardeman Bible Lectures. This year we will be studying the Compassion of Christ in Luke, and I am looking forward to it. Many of the lessons will be streamed online. If you're interested, you can find those on the website fhu.edu slash lectureship and I'll try to send out a link that'll be in the bulletin also in the email this coming Saturday night if you get those I plan on camping at a state park down there again Chickasaw State Park and if I survive four days with thousands of people my plan is to take the scenic route home from Tennessee uh, through Minneapolis, Minnesota, and then Duluth, and then head up the north shore of Lake Superior for some winter hiking and camping, and then followed by just a quick trip to the upper peninsula of Michigan for a couple days to pick up a fresh load of frozen pasties. I think uh, pretty much everything is frozen in the UP right now, but I'm looking forward to it. I did some camping up there last year, and I think it was about 16 degrees below zero when I was there, up near Hurley Ironwood, walking out to uh, doing some hiking near Lake Mich or Lake Superior up there. Uh, beautiful scenery. Uh, the lake was frozen at 16 below, so you could actually walk on Lake Superior, which was a pretty neat experience. So I hope to do that again this year, and I do plan on being with you this coming Sunday morning. And then again, hope to drive to Tennessee Sunday afternoon and then arrive down there at some point after midnight. Uh, today, I would like to start a brief series of Wednesday evening lessons on the subject of prophecy in the Bible. So prophecy. And in the bigger picture, we are headed toward the book of Genesis in the very near future. I kind of alluded to that uh, toward the end of our class last Wednesday evening, but I realized that we have just finished a long series of lessons from Luke and then a long series of lessons before that from uh, the book of Acts. So Luke and then Acts we've covered just now. And with Luke, we finished a 21-year study of the entire Bible, basically verse-by-verse -verse, uh, basis. And we then headed to Acts where we started back in April 2000. And in my mind, we need just a, a bit of a buffer before we jump back into another book of the Bible, especially a book like Genesis with 50 chapters. So I, I, we needed just a little bit of something in between, kind of a short study. And we've had some good questions about prophecy through the years. And several of you have asked a number of questions just in the recent past, over the last few months, over the last year or so. And we won't be going in depth here, but I do hope that we can hit some of the highlights of prophecy in the Bible, just learning a little bit here and there as we go, and to keep us on track, to give us some sense of direction and progress. I'm putting just a very rough outline on the side of the screen there. So if you notice there, this is where we're heading. We're going to start by defining some terms. What is a prophet? What is prophecy? Then we'll expand on the definition by giving some uh, basic principles of prophecy, some things to keep in mind. How do we define prophecy in a, a very practical way? And then, as you can see from the next uh, few items up there, I want to give some examples of prophecy. So on a national level, on a personal level, we'll look at some prophecies concerning uh, the Lord's church, the kingdom of God. And then finally, we'll look at some prophecies concerning Jesus. So uh, this morning or this uh, evening, rather, is kind of the introduction. And then hopefully in a few weeks, we'll get back to the national, personal, and the kingdom prophecies. And then the week after that, if the Lord wills, we'll spend an entire evening looking at prophecies concerning Jesus. But for tonight, though, let's at least work through the first couple items up here. We'll give just a brief introduction to prophecy in the Bible. Unfortunately, there is much that we do not know about the history of the word that we would translate into English as prophet or prophecy. Uh, one key passage in understanding the meaning of this word is found in Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. If you remember, uh, God speaks to Moses in the burning bush. He wants him to go talk to Pharaoh. And one of several objections that Moses gives to God is that he isn't a good speaker. I, I can't talk. I'm not a, I'm not a good talker. 
and I have kind of weakness in the way that I speak, something along those lines. And so uh, this verse up here is God's answer, or at least part of his answer to that objection. Notice what the passage says here. This is Exodus 7, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. And so Aaron then, we find in this passage, would be a prophet for his brother Moses. So not a prophet to God necessarily, but Aaron was a prophet to Moses. Well, when we look up the Hebrew word that is behind the English word prophet here, um, we find that it refers to a spokesman, a spokesperson, a speaker, a public speaker of some kind. And this word is used more than 300 times in the Old Testament. And I think it's a concept that we are uh, fairly familiar with today, the idea of a spokesperson, somebody who speaks on behalf of another, not with his or her own authority, but is simply passing along a message from somebody else. Uh, locally, our police department, for example, has uh, traditionally had a spokesman, and I can't remember who it is right now. I could have looked that up, but I know Joel Despain did it for a number of years and did a great job with it. I think he was retired from one of the, uh, or kind of a career change from one of the local news stations, and so from there he went to the police department serving as their uh, spokesman, or I guess literally we might say he was their prophet. He was speaking on behalf of the department. Uh, but his job was to simply speak on behalf of the entire police department. So if there was some extraordinarily grisly crime, some terrible thing happened in Madison, uh, some scandal, something newsworthy that uh, involved the police department, uh, he would be the one facing the cameras. And so he would go there, he would uh, show up in their press room, and the cameras would be invited. He would get up, he would explain the situation and take questions from the press. And so uh, he was a spokesman for the department, and we understand that concept. Uh, a number of uh, local companies have spokespeople as well. I think I've seen uh, spokesmen for a number of our local hospitals. And so if there's some issue that needs to be addressed in the news, there's kind of like this public relations department, and then there is a spokesman in that department who speaks on behalf of the administration of the hospital. We certainly see the same thing on a national level, don't we? I think uh, Jen Psaki right now is the White House press secretary, and so she is the spokesman for the president. She is the spokesman for the White House, and her job is simply to communicate. That's her mission, to try to communicate uh, what the president wants to get across and some information from his administration. So I think that's what we're dealing with here. A prophet is simply a spokesman on God's behalf. So that's the role of a prophet, a spokesman, a speaker who speaks on behalf of someone else. He or she does not speak on his or her own behalf. Uh, but as far as the Bible is concerned, a prophet is someone who speaks on God's behalf. And then, of course, this little reference here to Aaron being a prophet to Moses. So uh, Moses was communicating with God. Moses would communicate to Aaron. Aaron would pass it along to the people. So that was kind of the chain of command going on there. In English, we have the word prophet. And I, I know it's not the, the dictionary definition of this word, but when we look at the history of the word, the etymology of this word, it actually ultimately goes back to Latin, and it comes from two words meaning before or in front of, and then also the word to speak, to tell, or to say. And so in English, at least, the word prophet has the history of this. It is the idea of someone who speaks before or speaks forth on behalf of another. Um, we have another interesting reference in 1 Samuel chapter 9, where the word prophet and the word seer are used interchangeably. And so I know seer, S-E-E-R, someone who sees. Uh, this is a, a word that was sometimes used in Bible times, but there's this little verse in 1 Samuel chapter 9. Uh, going back to a time before Saul was king, you may remember Saul's father had lost his donkeys. So Kish, the father, uh, finally sends Saul and a servant out to find the donkeys. They look everywhere. They can't find them for quite some time. And so they're kind of thinking, well, at this point, my dad's going to be worried more about me than he is the donkey. So we need to go back and we need to find them. So um, Saul says, behold, now there is a man of God in this city and the man is held in honor. All that he says surely comes true. Now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us about our journey on which we have set out. 
Then Saul said to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is gone from our sack, and there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have in my hand a fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God, and he will tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he used to say, Come and let us go to the seer. For he who is called a prophet now was formerly called a seer. So again, this is 1 Samuel 9, verses 6 through 9. And there's a lot in the, the few verses here, but just a few things to note here in this passage. The reference is to a man of God who is known for knowing things. So they can't find the donkeys. They know that this guy knows stuff. And so they figure they'll go talk to him. I would also note that they... Uh, have this need. They feel the need to pay him for his work. So that's a part of it here that Saul was concerned that he didn't have anything to pay the man uh, so that he could tell them where the donkeys were. Uh, but then also this is where the author of 1 Samuel puts the explanation in the parentheses at the end. And I know the original text didn't have parentheses. Parentheses are a very modern invention, but it's a, a parenthetical thought, we might say. It's, it's, if, if they had parentheses, uh, the author certainly would have used him here. So there's this parenthetical explanation here. Uh, this man is described as being then basically both a seer and a prophet. So those two terms are used interchangeably here. A seer, again, S-E-E-R, simply a man who sees. It's kind of nice when the word defines itself like that. A uh, seer is somebody who sees, and then a prophet is a spokesman. So uh, this is where we have the idea that prophets may sometimes be able to see into the future. They see things. So not always, but it might be a part of it. So that's a little bit where some of the confusion about this word comes from. A lot of people hear prophet, they automatically think, um, you know, seeing the future. That's not necessarily the case. Um, but when it is, it is. So some have described this aspect of prophecy as opening a time capsule in reverse. So if you're a prophet, and God gives you some vision into the future. It's like opening a time capsule in reverse. And I appreciated that. I could understand that very simple picture. And it's something I can envision, something I can see in my mind. Uh, they may not have complete knowledge about everything that will ever happen. It's been described as seeing a mountain peak from a long way off. You don't see everything that's in the valleys, but you hit the highlights. And God may allow you to see just a little bit out there in the distant past. But they have this snapshot of the future. Uh, we think of the time capsule just found a few days ago here in Madison as they were tearing down the VFW. And this time capsule was apparently put in this brick wall when the building was first constructed back in 1966. So here we are, what, like 50-something uh, years later, and we have this little snapshot of what life was like at the VFW in Madison, Wisconsin back in 1966. Well, prophecy has been compared to the opposite of that. A prophet is, in a sense, opening a time capsule from the future. So there is this revelation from God. There are little bits and pieces of something many, many years off into the distant future. And this prophet is able, in a sense, to open this box and to bring out these things and to explain uh, God's will or God's communication from uh, this event in the future, some insight as to what will happen at some point in the future. Before we move on from the definition of what a prophet is, I want us to notice a few examples. And uh, sometime last year, one of the women of the congregation asked me something about the prophets. And I think the question might have been about whether I had a list of the prophets. And I'm not sure, it might have come through the Bible Correspondence Course program. It might have been some other reason, might have been a personal question, I'm not sure. But basically, um, you know, how many prophets were there in the Bible? Who were the prophets? And who all is described as being a prophet in the Bible? And anyway, I set out to compile a list uh, of all the prophets in the Bible. And I'll tell you, it got complicated rather quickly. <laughs> and this is, it's really a complex question. I looked it up online, did a search, a search here and there, found a number of lists online, but none of them really agreed with each other. So all the lists of prophets in the Bible, they were all different from one another. I did the best I could, though. I compiled a list of the prophets uh, to the best of my ability. I'll try to put this in the description of the YouTube video, as well as maybe put it in the comments of the Facebook group, and uh, might be able to send it out with the email notification. So no guarantees on this. Um, Please don't read this and see a mistake and say, Baxter's a false prophet. He mislabeled somebody. I hope you understand what I'm saying there. I'm not swearing to its complete accuracy. It is a work in progress. It's kind of a, a mushy subject in a little a bit of a way, a little squishy, kind of not, not a like hard data on here. 
So if you have any corrections, any additions, if there's somebody on here you think shouldn't be on there or somebody that I missed, let me know. But it is especially difficult to know who to include on a list like this because not everybody who prophesied is specifically described as being a prophet. So I hope that challenge makes sense to you. So if you just take a concordance or a Bible program and you just type in the word prophet, um, you may not find this many different people. Uh, then again, you may find that word repeated over and over and over again, maybe multiple times referring to the same person. So it's not as simple as just doing a Bible search or reading through the Bible and underlining all the times the word prophet is used. That's not really what we're uh, dealing with here. So it is complicated. And then how do you organize this thing? Uh, do we go with canonical order? That is, the order in which these men and women are found in the Bible. Do you start with the Genesis prophets and end with the Revelation prophets? Or do you organize it in some other way? Do we go alphabetical? Or maybe do we go chronological? Because canonical doesn't always match up with chronological order. Uh, in this list, I, yeah, I know it's tiny print here. This is not the point. I hope that you can get this list downloaded somewhere. I'll give it to you in hard copy if you want, and I'll be glad to mail it to you. But I went with alphabetical mainly so we can find them. So if you're wondering if so-and-so is a prophet, I can look it up on this list and go from there. So it's in alphabetical order, at least in this format. And then I made a column for the first reference. And this is another complicating factor. Some are mentioned multiple times in different books. Some are mentioned just in the old, just in the new. Some are in the old and the new. Uh, some from the old are only mentioned in the new, which is kind of weird to me. So anyway, I did the best that I could. So uh, be patient with me there. Again, if you find any issues that uh, need to be corrected, let me know. And, and some of these were a bit surprising. I learned a lot compiling this list. I... I never realized, for example, that Abel is described as being a prophet. I had no idea. If somebody said, hey, make a list of the prophets from memory, Abel would not have been on that list. And yet I believe he is described as a prophet in scripture. Uh, Abraham is described as being a prophet. He is called a prophet. And again, I mean, Abraham's an important man in the Bible, but did I know he was a prophet? No, I never really uh, considered that before. King Saul is described as prophesying. There are a group of people he went to and he hung out with them and he started prophesying just like the rest of them. And now that I read that, I'm like, yeah, I do remember seeing that before. But if you were to ask me a few years ago to make a list of the prophets, I don't think I would have ever put King Saul on a list of the prophets. Uh, Silas and Barnabas are both described as being prophets in the New Testament. You'll notice looking over these that most of these are men. But we do have several women on this list, which may be surprising to some people. This includes Miriam and Huldah in the Old Testament, Anna and Elizabeth in the New. Well, here's another weird thing. Anna and Elizabeth, although they're mentioned in the New Testament, they actually lived in Old Testament times, didn't they? Because they lived before the cross. So there's another complicating factor. Are they Old or New Testament prophets? I think I would consider them... Uh, Old Testament prophets. And again, a lot of people say there is that period of silence for 400 years between Malachi and John the Baptist. Uh, not really, because we know at least Anna and Elizabeth were prophets during that time period. So I know in a sense there was silence and that we don't have a written record, any written books of the Bible between Malachi and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I'm just saying this is uh, one of those things that further complicates making a list like this. Uh, we've got Philip's four daughters in the book of Acts. We just talked about them a couple months ago, and we went to that chapter in Acts. And then, then we have several false prophets. So do I put those on the list or not? I, I did because they are prophets. Uh, they are false prophets, but they are listed as being prophets. So again, it's complicated. Um, you know, a lot of a uh, lot of like, weird questions here. Uh, but I think I'll, I'll leave this here in case you would like to make some updates to it. And uh, hopefully you have a way of downloading that online and, and going from there. But uh, personally, there were more profits than I was expecting. Uh, a day or two ago, I went through this list again and tried to count. And I kept losing count because, you know, you'd be like one, two, three, four. And then you got like Philip's four daughters. And then you got these 70 profits over here. And then I got to add 70 to whatever. Plus, who knows? You know, I'm not the math guy. So I, I would say... Maybe uh, maybe a couple hundred on this list. I'm not sure, but a lot of prophets, a lot more than I was expecting. So in terms of defining what a prophet is, uh, I think it'd be very valuable to at least look at this and consider um, this list.
Our priority in the study, though, will be predictive prophecy. So again, I noted there was a difference between speaking for God and speaking for God concerning the future. So not just speaking on God's behalf, but more specifically for the rest of this study, I think we're going to be focusing on the kind of speaking on God's behalf where a prophet foretells the future in some way. And for this, we need to establish then some principles of prophecy. In other words, what makes a prophecy a prophecy, and why is this important? Why does this even matter? Um, it's been uh, it's been a bit difficult to summarize some of these, especially since some of these principles might overlap here and there. Uh, but we'll give it a shot, starting with the first principle here, in no particular order, as to the timing of the prophecy. There needs to be some distance between the prophecy and the fulfillment of the prophecy. So at least enough time between the prophecy and its fulfillment so that the prophecy is more than just an educated guess. In other words, if I predict that it will be cold in Wisconsin tomorrow, uh, that is probably an accurate statement, isn't it? But it is not predictive prophecy. It is not miraculous by any means. It is based on uh, an educated response to our environment over the past. So, okay, I've lived in Wisconsin for a, a number of decades now, and I'm pretty confident that February 3rd is going to be pretty cold in Wisconsin. So if I go out there on the street corner saying, it's going to be cold tomorrow, you need to listen to me, I'm a messenger from God, uh, that really doesn't do it, does it? So uh, there needs to be some distance. It needs to be more than simply an educated guess based on experience. And so uh, this is not what predictive prophecy is. Prophecy is not just making predictions based on experience, but there needs to be a gap proving that the prediction was truly miraculous. By the way, this gap was uh, confirmed by the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, first discovered, I think, back in 1947, and then for a few years after that, they continued to find more and more. But for years, critics of the Bible said some of the prophecies from the Old Testament were so incredibly accurate that the books must have been updated that they must have been adjusted through the years so that the, they were saying there's no way this is too accurate it, it must have been you know written just a few hundred years back or whatever there must have been changes made and yet when we found the dead sea scrolls we found some amazingly well preserved copies of many of the old testament books that were hidden in caves back around the first century and those copies are almost identical to the copies of copies of copies of copies of copies that we've been dealing with up to this point. So just I'm just saying, confirming this massive gap in time from the prophecies themselves to the fulfillment of those prophecies. So if we're going to call it a predictive prophecy, if we're going to nail it down as being uh, miraculous or you know rock solid from God, not from man. There has to be some gap in the timing. It has to be more than simply an educated guess. So that's the first basic principle of predictive prophecy. Uh, secondly, as to the details, a prophecy needs to be specific. It cannot be just some general statement that is so mushy that it can't be nailed down. So um, it needs to be specific. If, if I say, for example, a great leader will arise in the future, a great leader will arise in the future, that right there does not meet the um, criteria of a, of a true predictive prophecy. It's not specific enough, is it? So that could apply to anybody. You know, 300 years from now, we could have some amazing leader and they'll say, oh, look, there's this old YouTube video uh, Baxter Exum, back in you know February 2nd, 2022, he predicted that there would be a great leader arise, and here he is. You know, look at that. It's an amazing thing. Of course, that's not the way it works. On the other hand, if I were to give the name of someone who would be elected president exactly 300 years from now, if I say, you know, he's got red hair and you know, wears blue or whatever all the time, you know, that kind of thing. I think we're getting more specific there where that would be more of an amazing thing. So it, it can't be some uh, detail that lacks uh, specifics. It needs to be a very specific statement. And I think that would be a much better example. Uh, by the way, a groundhog predicting an early spring or six more weeks of winter, 
uh, might get disqualified on that one. I think that's rather mushy. How do you how do you define that? More winter, more spring, sooner, later? I, I don't know. I'm not exactly how you would uh, judge exactly whether that comes true or not. So it's not a miraculous predictive uh, prophecy to anticipate an early spring or six more weeks of winter or whatever. Uh, this is also where we have a problem with uh, some uh, supposed prophets like Nostradamus. Uh, every once in a while, we might hear someone from, uh, you know, something from Nostradamus that, that makes us wonder. We think, ooh, that, that's, an, that's an interesting thing. You know, is there something to this? Uh, but then so many other things he wrote were just a real stretch in, in terms of, I mean, you think, okay, well, maybe, maybe not. And so some of those things were uh, really stretching it. For example, uh, back in, I think it was 1555, he wrote a book of prophecies, kind of in poetry form. And let me read you one of those. This is what he wrote back in 1555. To maintain the great troubled cloak, the Reds marched to clear it. A family almost ruined by death, the Red Reds strike down the Red One. Okay, that's a little weird, isn't it? Well, some have looked at that and they have said, wow, in those lines, Nostradamus predicted the fate of the Kennedy family. Nostradamus predicted everything that happened in the Kennedy family. And yet we go back and we read that over and over. And really? No, there's there's really no way. It's so mushy. It's not specific enough. We don't have nearly enough detail in that little quote to consider that a predictive prophecy. And I would just say there are many others that fall into that category. Thirdly, as to the fulfillment of the prophecy, it must not be something that the prophet can affect. In other words, I cannot predict that this pen will fall to the ground 30 seconds from now. Does that make sense? Because as the prophet, I can affect the outcome of the prophecy, and, and that uh, invalidates this as any kind of uh, miraculous predictive prophecy. So we, we're not talking about something that the prophet himself or herself uh, can change or can affect in some way. So I can predict it, but if I'm able to directly affect the outcome of that prediction, it, it does not qualify as any kind of miraculous prediction. So I think that's a, kind of a no-brainer there, but we do need to throw that in uh, because we do find that from time to time today. And then finally, as to the accuracy of the prophecy, um, there can be no mistakes. As Wayne Jackson points out in his article on prophecy, which is very well written, he says, to be 80% accurate is not accurate at all. And I appreciate how he worded that. In fact, uh, God gives his divine standard for prophets in Deuteronomy 18.22, when he says, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. And in fact, the penalty for prophesying falsely was death. And for an example of this, uh, I think of how the Book of Mormon has a prediction that Jesus would be born in the city of Jerusalem. That comes in their book of Alma, chapter 7, verse 10. And I've talked to some uh, Mormon so-called elders about this. You know, sometimes if they come to my door, um, I'll ask them. I'll say, so where was, where was Jesus born again? And they'll say, well, Bethlehem. Well, how about if we look that up in your book? You've got the book of Mormon there. How about if we turn to Alma 7, verse 10? And can you read that for me? And they'll read Alma 7, verse 10. And it's a prediction written supposedly before Jesus was born, predicting that he would be born um, in the city of Jerusalem. And I've talked about this, and, and some have explained this by saying, well, well, he was actually born in Bethlehem, but uh, Bethlehem was a, was a suburb of, of Jerusalem. Uh, it is, isn't it? it? It is an outlying village, but uh, it's not actually Jerusalem where the verse actually says Jesus is to be born in Alma 7, verse 10. So this, this Bible uh, that we believe in, though, very accurately predicts that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And this gives us one more reason to believe in the Bible itself. So prophecy confirms the word of God as being true, not just with the prophecy, but it gives us faith to believe it in other areas as well. So we'll get back to the Bethlehem thing in a few weeks when we come to the prophecies about Jesus. 
So these are the essential elements, these four, the essential elements of predictive prophecy. But I would add one more, just throwing it in here as something of a reminder, kind of a, a bonus here would, would be number five, not really a principle of prophecy, but kind of another reminder here. That is, prophecy itself is temporary. And this basic principle is communicated in various ways in several different passages. But I would just share 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10, those we skipped a forward to a few minutes ago accidentally. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. This is where Paul compares the enduring nature of love to the temporary nature of the miraculous gifts, including prophecy. So in this context, this is what Paul says. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues referring to the miraculous gift of speaking in other languages, they will cease. If there is knowledge, the idea of miraculous knowledge directly from God, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. And my understanding of this passage is that when the uh, perfect, when Paul refers to the perfect here, that's a reference to the perfect and complete word of God. Um, once the written word of God was completed, those miraculous spiritual gifts would come to an end. And also from a practical point of view, the means of transmitting those gifts have come to an end. We know from Acts 8, for example, that the miraculous gifts were only given to others through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And since we no longer have any apostles around today, we no longer have those miraculous spiritual gifts. So this seems to be, I think, a pretty good place for us to pause for tonight. So far, we've looked at what prophecy really is. So the definition of prophecy, we've also looked at some basic principles of predictive prophecy. Um, I'll be away for the next couple Wednesdays, so we'll have some guest speakers, I believe, for the next two weeks. But I hope we can return on February 23rd, I think it is, to study some examples of predictive prophecy. So that'll be the rest of our study here, these next four categories. And uh, I hope to start with some prophecies from the Bible concerning several nations. Then we'll work to like individual people, then the kingdom or the church, and then some prophecies about Jesus is how we'll wrap this up on the very last class for this uh, for this little series. But I do hope to see you this coming Sunday for worship at either 9 or 11. Uh, this would be a great time to sign up online if you can, if you haven't done so already. And then I hope to see you this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. also. I think we'll wrap up our study of the exploits of King David. As we come to the end of tonight's study, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we're thankful for your inspired word, and we're especially thankful not only for your servants, the prophets, but we're thankful for prophecy itself. We're thankful for the confidence that it gives us, giving us reason upon reason to put our trust in your inspired word, the Bible. Thank you, Father, for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. Thank you for brothers and sisters who care for us and check on us and challenge us. This evening, we pray for wisdom as we struggle with sin, that we would keep up the struggle. We pray that we would always look for and take the way of escape that you provide for us. Help us, Father, to be an encouragement to others. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen.